The battle at Gallipoli had been a stalemate for months, but the Allies had landed tens of thousands of troops last week in a fresh attempt to gain the high ground. But what happens when new recruits who've never seen battle take on a battle-hardened enemy? You'll find out in just a minute. I'm Andy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week, Warsaw, the capital of Russian Poland, had finally fallen to the German juggernaut after its evacuation. The Germans now had the Russian fortress of Kovno, or Kaunas, under siege in Russian Lithuania. At Gallipoli, the British had made a successful landing at Suvla Bay, but had only advanced a short way across the plain before halting, while New Zealander troops finally held the high ground of Chunuk Bayir. And the new synchronization gear, developed by Anthony Fokker for the Germans, that allowed a machine gun to fire between propeller blades, gave the Germans mastery of the skies. That was over on the Western Front at the moment, and I'll take a look there first this week. On August 7th, the Germans attacked in the Argonne and the Vosch, but were knocked back with casualties estimated at around 4,000. Twice more they would try this week to break through in the Argonne, failing both times. Also in the West, Zeppelin raids on the east coast of Britain, the 9th and 13th, claimed 29 civilian lives. Still, the civilians in Britain had it far better than those in Eastern Europe, many of whom were in full flight, destroying their property and burning their farms as they fled from the German Colossus. The German army that took Warsaw advanced eastward, and the Russian army fell back, leaving as defense the fortress of Novo Georgievsk with 90,000 men as the garrison. This was where the Vistula and Boot rivers come together, but it didn't slow the German advance at all. They surrounded it and set siege to it, but continued on, leaving 80,000 non-frontline soldiers as the siege troops, and beginning to bring in the big howitzers, the 16-inch guns that had demolished Antwerp last fall. The same commander from that siege, General Hans Hartwig von Bessler. There was a lot of German and Russian action far to the north, as the Germans made moves toward both Riga and Kovno. Twice this week, the German Navy bombarded Riga, but were driven off both times, while on the 7th, near Riga itself, the Russians pushed back the Germans. At Kovno, German artillery began bombarding the forts on the 8th with the great Gamma Gerat Howitzer, whose shells weighed a ton and had a range of 14 kilometers. But the Russians fought off several attempts to break through the perimeter, inflicting severe casualties on the Germans. On the 9th, the Germans tried a night attack, but lost a full three battalions to the Russian counterattack. Just a side note here, the German artillery bombardment was so fantastic that it could apparently be heard as far away as Vilnius, 100 kilometers away. Even though the Russian counterattacks were effective at the beginning of the week, by the end of it, both Vilnius and Kovno were being evacuated though the Germans still could not break through. But the artillery was wreaking havoc on the forts defending the fortress. Back at home in Berlin, the Kaiser this week authorized a battalion of 2,000 men that would be entirely Finns to fight against Russia. The recruits were to be smuggled out of Finland, which had loads of Russian police, so everything was done in total secrecy. One other thing that happened this week involving Germany, at the end of the week, Austro-Hungarian and German armies made contact west of Brest-Litovsk. They now formed an unbroken line, encircling three Russian armies and probably foreshadowing yet another disaster for the Russians. And one of the greatest disasters of the war, Gallipoli, continued this week with fresh attacks. On August 9th, the attack on Koja Chementepe was renewed. British and Gurkha forces actually reached the top and fought off the Turkish counterattack with a bayonet charge. They were even about to drive the Turks down the far side when British naval gunners, unaware of their success, fired upon them and forced them back. The New Zealand forces that had held Chunuk Bayir for a couple of days now faced an attack by Turkish forces commanded by Mustafa Kemal. They counterattacked brilliantly and had the Turks in disarray. Kemal's staff wanted to retreat, but the recently promoted Kemal, now a colonel and awarded the Iron Cross first class by the Germans, said this, Don't rush it, my sons. Don't be in a hurry. We will choose exactly the right minute, then I shall go out in front. When you see me raise my hand, look to it that you have your bayonets sharp and fixed and come out after me. Meanwhile, the New Zealanders had finally been relieved by two battalions from Lord Kitchener's new army who had never seen action. The 6th Loyal North Lancashires and the 5th Wiltshires. On the morning of August 10th, at 4.45 a.m., Mustafa Kemal raised his hand 
and walked forward. His now six Turkish battalions charged the Lancashires and bayoneted them to the man. And in an incredible stroke of bad luck for the British, the Wiltshires below had just put down their rifles to rest and could only helplessly run away. So the Turks charged down the slope, hoping to force the Allies completely from the hill. But New Zealand machine gunners on the next spur opened fire and stopped the Turkish left flank. The right flank reached a plateau called the Farm, where they met the 38th Brigade. Hand-in-hand -hand fighting broke out, and after half of the brigade had been killed or wounded, including Brigadier General A.H. Baldwin, the survivors on both sides fell back. The British further downhill, and the Turks up on the ridge. Once again, Chunuk Bayir was in Turkish hands. The Allied lines were further inland than before, yes, but still stuck on the western side of the peninsula. Just think, for a short while, those New Zealander troops that had held the top of Chunuk Bayir could actually see the waters of the Narrows shimmering and glistening below them. The target, the main goal. Perhaps one day they'd see them again. At Suvla Bay, where British troops had successfully landed last week, there were several days of fighting early this week. In fact, 25 British battalions were ashore by the 7th, and German Admiral von Tirpitz wrote this day in his diary. Heavy fighting has been going on since yesterday at the Dardanelles. The situation is obviously critical. Should the Dardanelles fall, the world war has been decided against us. Now, as we saw last week, the troops that landed didn't advance across the coastal plain towards Akibaba, and this hesitation would prove disastrous over the next few days. British official historian, Brigadier General Aspinall Oglander, there's a mouthful, was harsh on them. Quote, by the hesitation and delay of the 7th and 8th of August, the advantages gained by the surprise landing at Suvla had all been thrown away. It was now to be a fight between forces of equal numbers, with the British troops in the open and the Turks in possession of every point of vantage. Once the prize had gone, there was little chance with anything approaching equal numbers of scoring a British success." End quote. He also noted that the British battalions were new army troops straight out of England, and the Turks were experienced and far superior to them. So, for the total four days of battle for Suvla Bay and Chunuk Bayer, 50,000 British and Anzac troops had fought, with 10,000 killed and 2,000 wounded. But more than 20,000 sick and wounded men were taken from Gallipoli to hospitals in either Egypt or Malta. By the end of the week, the hospitals were full. And completely failing to learn from their earlier mistake, when the assault was renewed the 13th, the troops again advanced from Suvla Bay, stopped, and dug a line of trenches when they reached Anafarta Ridge, even though there were no Turks or Turkish trenches anywhere in sight, and they could have continued a lot further and captured high ground. Within 24 hours, the Turkish 5th Division had driven them back toward the bay. Also on the 13th, the Allied troop transport, the Royal Edward, all 11,000 tons of her, was sunk by a German sub off the island of Kos. 1,865 soldiers drowned. And we come to the end of the week. The German and Austrian forces linking up in a solid line that spells trouble for the Russians. The Russians under siege in Kovno and Novogeorgievsk. The Germans failing in the Argonne and the Allies failing at Gallipoli. For you can't call it anything but a failure. Taking a few dozen meters of new ground isn't a success when you have entire battalions being basically wiped out. I can understand that those New Zealander troops holding Chunuk Bayir desperately needed relief. And the Lancashires and Wiltshires may have been the only troops available, but those men, those raw recruits who'd never seen combat, were simply sent to the slaughter. I don't think there's any strategy that can justify that. But, you know, 2020 hindsight is easy, but 2020 foresight is absolutely impossible in modern war. And in the end, there were many people who said beforehand that taking the Dardanelles is impossible. Even Winston Churchill, who came up with the plan in late 1914, had said so a few years earlier. Still, they tried, and it didn't look good from day one. You can click here to find out how the Gallipoli landings happened a few months ago. Here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Seth Minahan. Thank you, Seth. Help us reach our goals on Patreon and get awesome perks in return. For more updates on World War I, follow us on Twitter. See you next time.